good day, good day or good evening or, well, yes, <laughs> either one of the two to all you YouTubers. And greetings in His Imperial Majesty's name, Lord Yeshua, to all believers. I hope that uh, He's using you mightily for His glory and your greater good. Isn't it interesting how true God's word is when it says about how there are many who are put on airs of godliness yet are denying the power of Because today I want to share with you a faith building, um, well, yet another sharing of um, David L's book, Sovereign God For Us and Through Us. Because really, if you think about it, we're not seeing the miracles that we should see. We're not seeing people raised from the dead, although there are some claims, but maybe the uh, Satan system hides such events from the world, or um, maybe they are, in some cases, uh, performed by charlatans. We have to realize that the devil tries to imitate God in any way he possibly can, because he's a deceiver and a destroyer. Look how cleverly he's working his way into the minds of people now. I'm sure you lot have learnt, I'm sure most of you know about the uh, series called Lucifer. I personally will never ever watch it. Not that it's going to um, divert my course in believing and trusting in the Lord Yeshua. But, um, you know, it's just the whole concept of it just makes me laugh. I mean, he's got, what is this? Um, oh, yes, he's. He's got a lovely name as well, isn't it? Was it Lucifer Morningstar? And um, I'm sure you know the synopsis. You know, maybe some of you even look, even even looked at it, curious like. You know what I mean? But I just don't see it as entertainment. I, I see it as a deception. I see it as a subtle form of brainwashing. So anyway, the the synopsis is that um, he's bored in hell, and so he decides to um, come to Los Angeles. And then he ends up uh, teaming up with a murder detective and helping her solve cases. Well, the lie at the very beginning there is that he's come from hell. You see, and I, okay, and I, I know I might not be sure on this, but I'm sure the scriptures tell us that, you know, hell is reserved. In other words, the pit hasn't been opened yet, you know. The lake of fire hasn't been established yet. You know, maybe it's in the centre of the earth, as some people believe. Who knows? You know, I mean, I find it interesting that there's so many billions of Christians believing they're going to heaven, when really the scriptures prove otherwise. That um, Jesus comes to earth, he reigns on earth for a thousand years. Satan gets released because remember, Satan is a beast for that period of time, so he can have no influence on mankind. So, you know, because that's that's the loving God that we have. You know, he wants to be vindicated, he wants to be justified, he, he doesn't, you know, you know how much it hurts him when people blame him for all the suffering in the world, you know, he's not, he's not responsible for that, you know, that's Satan and, 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 the, and the wickedness of man, working hand in hand, you know, as we read in the scriptures, spirits of wickedness in high places, yeah, some people think that means up here in the brain, oh, Maybe on one aspect, but you know, we always always have to look at God's word on, you know, more than one level. You know, as I keep on saying to people, just let Scripture interpret Scripture. You know, and the Holy Spirit will reveal, you know, more than that. It's, and isn't it interesting how people love to quote Scripture, and then if someone says that, that you know their interpretation is slightly different, yeah. Now, don't don't agree. I don't agree with a certain character on 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 here that's um, you know giving his, uh, what is it, exoter esoteric musings on the scriptures, because we cannot be mixing um, occult beliefs with, with God's word. You know, as the Bible says, light and darkness has no fellowship. In fact, it says the darkness flees from the light. So, um, you know, I'm not going to, to um, endorse that way of looking at God's word. But I will be endorsing what this guy's saying because it, it just actually opens up the scriptures and it really says it like it is. So, without further ado, let's begin. So this video will be called The Sovereignty of God Through Us. See, we read, it, we read, we read in Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I that live 
but Christ living in me. Now, you have to believe that. If you believe that, then Christ will work through you, and you will become Christ-like. But the sad thing is, many professing Christians don't believe that. I experienced it only yesterday. I was with a group of people who we were protesting that horrendous massacre that happened on Easter Day in Lahore, Pakistan. And I saw all the different spirits that were there. I saw spirits of meanness. I saw spirits of timidity. You know. But I did meet some like-minded, fantastic individuals. Like, you know, and we encouraged one another. And we invigorated one another. And it was a wonderful, blessed day. And I, I thank my Lord Jesus for all that. You know. I mean, it's quite an experience when I think about it. Because um, it was like as if the spirit wouldn't let me rest on the Friday night. I could not get any kind of sleep. I was tossing and turning the whole night. So in the end, I just gave up. I got up at 6 a.m., had a cup of coffee. Well, it wasn't exactly a cup of coffee. It's, um, some of you might know, it's called Caro. I can't remember now. I know it's got, um, oh, was it rye in it and other bits and pieces? But it's by Nestle. And while on the subject of Nestle, I will not be buying any more Nestle products. And I urge any one of you that comes by to boycott Nestle. For two major reasons. One, the CEO has declared that people should pay for water. Well, we know that water is the essence of life, yeah? And we know that our Lord Yeshua is the spirit of living waters, yeah? As he said to the w w woman of Samaria at the well, when you drink from me, you will no longer thirst. Anyway, so this man has said that, you know, and, and that's what nest they get up to. They go to places in in areas in South America and so on, like and, and parts of America, and they steal water, and not just that, just like PepsiCo, and they denature it. They take out any goodness that's in it, any natural minerals. How wicked can that be? Is that like is that their way? In other words, do they have a two tier um, system like? You know what I mean, where you get the denatured water, or you or you get the natural water with all the goodness in it. You know. Either way. You know, and then, you know, I urge people to see the documentary here on YouTube, The Dark Side of Chocolate. And you will see that Nestle is part of a conglomerate of corporations. And you will see that they condone and, and you know, make no effort whatsoever to stop the child slavery and trafficking in the Ivory Coast, where a lot of uh, coffee beans are grown yeah sorry not just not coffee i mean you know the, the 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 cocoa yeah the cocoa beans that you know that from which we get chocolate you know please do because you know i, I couldn't believe what was going on there like you know it's, it's disgusting that these corporations allow these things to go on i mean you know they've got influence and so on you know they could turn around and say to these farmers like you know we've discovered that you're employing child labor you know, because because you see, the sad thing is that these poor children, yeah, they are bought and sold. They work on those plantations. They don't get any wages. They don't get any education. That you know, I don't even know what happens to them. Like if they get sick, because remember that these 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 youngsters are being exposed to pesticides. They're not giving any protective clothing. You know. So you know, you can imagine like, as they get older, you know, the the ailments that, that no doubt they that, that hit you know hit them like you know. Because you're exposed to pesticides, you know, it's a, it's a long, long, ongoing process. But in the end, you know, it starts manifesting itself with, with different problems. So, yeah, that's my beef about uh, Nestle, you know, and any other. Well, I can't. Oh, yeah, Kraft. Would you believe that Kraft? You know, oh, Philadelphia. Yeah. Well, I don't buy any Kraft products, you know, but I knew about them anyway because they actually, in, you know, have uh, GMO in their products. So. But, you know, going back to God's word yet again, you know, and you see, it's, I guess it's how people read it. You see, can, you see, the Bible should be read on two levels. It should be read on a basic physical level, and it should be read, on, be read on a spiritual level, you know. And so, basically, when God says, my people are destroyed through lack of knowledge, he's saying that, you know, that that's what happens like. Because, remember, he considers all, all of us as God's people, yeah? You know, as it says at the end, you know, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. You know, so he, so he views the whole world as as his as his people because they are his creations, yeah. 
But as you know, you know, as I try and explain to people, you know, when people go about, oh, how can a loving God send people to hell? No, we send ourselves to hell if we continue to defy him, if we continue to refuse to be ruled by him. Because, as, as you know, I love that word, the you know, thing in, the, in, in God's word, it says about, you know, Jesus says, come, learn of me, and uh, I will take your burdens, and I will place my yoke upon you, which is light, and not burdensome. Yeah? Because it isn't. You know, because when you're given the yoke of love, you know, you don't want to lie to people. You don't want to steal from people. You don't want to hurt people, you know. And secondly, you know, because you're grateful that you've been delivered from sin and because you're grateful that you've been delivered from all the um, maladies that come through living a sinful life, you know, you're so grateful that, uh, and, and, you know, and, and because his love is within you, you know, you, you don't want to practice those things anymore. Anyway, let us continue. So, I agree with the author when he says this. I am learning that it is not I living the Christian life and doing the works of Christ, but it is I accepting my death so that Christ may live and do his works through me. See, Jesus gave up his natural body in order to take up a corporate body so that he could continue on a much larger scale his deliverance of, his, of this fallen creation. If we, re we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now ye are the body of Christ, and severally members thereof. Therefore we are not the body of another Jesus, a weak and worthless Jesus. We are the body of the same Jesus who walked in that first body, exercising our Heavenly Father's power to set the captives free. In Hebrews 13, 8 it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today, yea, and forevermore. See, it is sad that most do not agree that Christ's plan is to continue exercising the sovereignty that he had in his first body in his second one. Yeah? In Amos 3.3, 3, we read, it says, Shall two walk together except they have agreed? So anyway, as, as the author says, This chapter will be devoted to bringing us into agreement with the word so that Christ may walk in us and exercise his sovereignty through us. It says, A king's sons are princes who grow up to inherit his authority and exercise his sovereignty. In Psalm 45, 16 we read, Instead of thy fathers shall be thy children, whom thou shalt make princes in all the earth. So the mind of the flesh is enemy of God, yeah, and cannot be subject to him, as Romans 8, 7 states. See, in Adam we all died and were made useless to God. But by abiding in Christ, who is the word, we become vessels of his reigning authority. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22, we read, As in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. In Romans 5, 17, we read, For if by the trespass of the one death reigned through the one, much more shall they that receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one, even Jesus Christ. See, we were meant to accept God's grace and reign of life. As the Adamic mind dies in us, the spiritual man comes to life. In 2 Corinthians 4.16 we read, We therefore, we faint not, but though our outward man, that's the Ad Adamic nature of self, is decaying, yet our inward man, that's Christ in us, is renewed day by day. As we read the word and repent of our carnal thinking and life to accept Christ's thinking and life, he is able to reign through us. And of course we are constantly at war with that. You know, Paul admitted that, you know. Some believe that Paul was covetous and that was the thorn on his side. You know, but then he always corrects himself saying, in my weakness, Christ can work through me. You know, in other words, once we just, how you say, allow the Spirit to work through us, then we can achieve all things. You know, I was amazed yesterday that the fact that I went through a whole, well, it was about, yeah, say, say it was about uh, 11 hours, yeah, without any, any fluid, without any food, you know, and it was only to the very end, just just before I was reaching home, that I started feeling faint. Well, not faint, but, you know, weary, yeah? You know, sleepy. But up until, you know, that time, you know, I was ministering with the brother and, you know, and it, it, was, just, it was just a fantastic experience. There we are on the streets of London, and we were meeting all kinds of people. Drunks, homeless, you know, they were just coming to us, vlogging to us. I mean, many were tourists who wanted to take a photograph of, the, of, of my brother because, well... He's a Scotsman, and he was in full Scottish regalia, you know. And I guess they saw him almost like as if, you know, the same as if they would stand beside the, you know, the uh, household cavalry, 
just down the road. But you know, we we, we greeted all of them with with, with um, you know graciousness and friendliness, and you know, and and it was wonderful to see them all walk away, you know, with, with you know happiness. Yeah, you know, we met them on their level, you know, and we even helped this well drunken couple. But you know, basically the the guy was, you know, not so. You know, he was only half cut, but his 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 girlfriend was just totally almost comatose actually you know and he was complaining about it he says oh you know it's only eight o'clock and look at her like i can't i, I can't handle this and so on like well we just we just graciously said well look we'll get you a tax and that sort of thing and, and we helped prop her up and you know we sit her down like because she was, she, was, she just wanted to lay down i mean you know she just wanted to sleep it off you know I mean, we could see his frustration embarrassment some but we didn't you know we didn't start whacking him with scripture and that sort of thing but we just you know and and he, he he was he said I said I can't believe people like you he said I, I he said I, you know and I just sort of like said to him I said maybe you should give Jesus a try yeah you know see how much it will change your life you know and it's quite an interesting background he came from actually because apparently he actually worked for Formula One you know so obviously he was you know up there with the elites you know and speaking of elites it was quite funny we had a you know the typical bowler hatted gentleman pass by you know not pinstripe but uh, you know fully decked out you know wearing the um red and gold scarf and i can't remember what the, and it's quite funny because he spoke he was quite surprised when i said i knew about chaps because that's a, a kind of like um you know upper class uh etiquette clothing magazine you know design as it says to you know equip the well-dressed gentleman you know and it, it it goes back to the old days it's a whole whole idea of um you know a true gentleman and you know etiquette and how you know in funny enough when you think about it i mean you know actually almost christ-like in a way because it's about being you know decent it's about treating people right you know that you know respecting people and he was amazing i mean you know he's he spent a good time with us you know and he was he, we had a really good debate with him it was re really you know it was quite revealing and um so i thank the lord that you know brought all these people along it was it was just a wonderful experience you know and i thought so that's what it's like when you fully surrender to the Lord, you know. He says, right, I'm going to use you now. I'm going to bring these people your way and you're going to either encourage them or you're going to educate them or, you know. And it was just fantastic. I mean, we, we even had some religious folks come up. We had a um, Australian Catholic woman who came up. Uh, apparently she's in charge of the uh, of a Facebook page to do with um, anti-knife crime. Um I think it's actually called Anti Knife Initiative, but it's basically to try and get knives off off of you, you know, and, and, and well, hopefully change, stop this um, gang culture, you know, because it's terrible knife crime. And I don't know what it's like in other parts of the world, but here in England, like you know, it, it doesn't get widely reported, but you know, you you get the occasional one breakthrough knife attack and someone killed, and you know, it's, see, but that's it, you know, those who live by the sword die by the sword, you know, as God's word rightly says, you know. It's like that old, um, who was that now? I can't remember what the artist was, but you know, you know, there's always someone badder than you, yeah? You know, so you think you're bad, yeah? I mean, well, remember last week, Michael Jackson's song, wasn't it? Who's bad, yeah? You know, because the sad thing there, wasn't it, how black people decided to try and twist the things around and, you know, bad meant, you know, good and all this kind of thing, like, you know, crazy, crazy. See how Satan operates, how he, he will twist words around to, you know, change it. I mean, it makes me laugh now. People call something sick. Well, sorry, sick usually means you're ill. You know, don't say how something can be sick. You know, you know they're, they're, they're watching me and say, oh, that was sick, man. You know, <laughs> come on. But, you know, and everyone says, oh, yeah, well, you know, you just got to go with the time. You're just changing, you know, what's it called? Um, not anachronisms. I've forgotten the word now, but, you know. Still, there you go. Anyway, let us continue. So, as 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, Wherefore we faint not, as I did yesterday, but though our outward man, the Adamic nature of self, is decaying, yet our inward man, that's Christ in us, is renewed day by day. As you read the word and repent of our carnal thinking and life to accept Christ's thinking and life, he is able to reign through us. In 2 Corinthians 4.11 it says, for we who live are always delivered unto death, that means to self, for Jesus' sake, yeah, that the life also of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. 
See, through death to self, we can expect the life of Jesus to be manifested in our human bodies. The life of Christ here is not only his fruit, but also his ministry, as we shall see. Those who teach that we cannot expect the life of Christ in this life are deceivers. Those who preach that as long as we are in this body, we will always be bondage to sin are deceivers. Second John 7 says, For many deceivers have gone forth into the world, even they that confess not that Jesus Christ cometh in the flesh. See, when Jesus physically comes again, he will have a glorified body, but he is coming now in the flesh of his body of believers. Those who preach that our ultimate hope here is only to be forgiven and not transformed are deceivers. Paul explained that he was revealing a mystery with the words, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Quoting Colossians 1.27 he said that the wisdom in this mystery was to present every man perfect, and that means complete or mature, in Christ. Quoting verse 28. See, Christ in you has power over sin and the curse around us. As we come to realize the purpose of Christ is to live in us, our faith in what he can do in us and through us grows exponentially. In Philemon 1.6 we read that the fellowship, or mean sharing in common, of thy faith may become effectual, to the knowledge of every good thing which is in you unto Christ. See, as we accept the mind of Christ, which is the word of God, it transforms us. In Romans 12, 2, we read, And be not fashioned according to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, and ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, if we do not repent, Greek means change our mind, when we read the word, we do not accept the transformation to the life and work of Christ. The first thing we must believe is in the gospel. In Galatians 2.20 it says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I that live, but Christ living in me. The old me died at the cross, and now Jesus lives in me. Faith in this justifies us and entitles us to the power to bring it to pass. Because many do not understand this, they believe we have no hope but to continue in sin and count on God's grace for forgiveness. See, Romans 6.1 says, Shall we continue in sin, that grace may abound? God forbid! We who die to sin, how shall we any longer live therein? Notice that because of grace we do not have to live in sin. He says, Or are ye ignorant that all we who were baptized unto Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him through the baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. See, when we were baptized, the old sinner died and was buried, so now we can walk in new life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. See, by faith at baptism we both die and resurrect. Neither a dead man nor a resurrected man can sin. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away, that so we should no longer be in bondage to sin. See, through faith we died, and now Jesus lives in us. We were delivered out of the power of darkness, as Colossians 1.13 says. This is the real good news that no one is preaching. See, we're only free from the power of sin if we believe it. We can now use these promises as a two-edged sword to destroy corruption in our lives. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Having therefore these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. See, we are responsible to cleanse ourselves by faith in the promises. See, those who believe the promises will bear fruit. As a type, Mary believed the promise that she was to bear the fruit of Jesus in her mortal body. See Luke 1, 31-35. And Jesus said, My mother and my brethren are these that hear the word of God and do it. Quoting Luke 8, 21. In a type, we who bring forth the fruit of Jesus are his mother. In the parable of the sower, Jesus sowed the seed, and the Greek word is sperma, or sperm, of the word in our heart. Since the word is the spiritual sperm of Jesus, it can only bring forth his fruit. No word from man or religion can do this. Only one of the four types that received the word bore fruit, 30, 60, or 100 fold. Mary was told, Blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a fulfillment of the things which have been spoken to her from the Lord. Quoting in Luke 1.45. See, because she believed the word, she bore the fruit of Jesus. The word must be believed for it to be fulfilled in us. See, in Hebrews 4.2 we read, For indeed we have good tidings, in other words, the gospel preached unto us, even as also they. But the word of hearing did not profit them, because it was not united by faith with them that heard. 
See, we can hear the gospel, but make it ineffective by our own unbelief, as Israel did. By bearing the fruit of the same Jesus, we are proving who the true believers are. Jesus said, ye shall know them by their fruits, not by who they say they are. Paul showed us how to exercise this faith with our renewed imagination. 2 Corinthians 3.18 said, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are transformed into the same image from glory to glory, even as from the Lord the Spirit. And that's like the thing about, you know, and the man looking in the mirror and walking away and forgetting what he saw. Yeah? Therefore he's denying, denying the power of God. He may be putting on airs of godliness, but he's denying its power. So therefore he doesn't drink, gather forth any fruits. See, if our face is truly unveiled, then we see by faith the finished work of God in the mirror, which is Christ in you, the hope in glory. Should I say the hope of glory? Only seeing the Jesus of the word in the mirror will transform us into the image of God. The Jesus we must we see must be the one who has power over sin and the curse around us. Most Christians would think us proud to look in the mirror by faith and see Jesus, but in truth, these are the only ones who are humble to the word. And the amazing thing about what I'm reading here, this recalls to mind what my um, SDA brother, and I'd love to get him out of that religion, you know what I mean, because he, he does have a, a, a Christ-like spirit in him, you know what I mean, he does have a genuine care and concern for others. You know, but I can see sometimes that religious spirit coming in, you know, critical, etc. And, um, you know, he actually said one day, he said, he said, I see more of Jesus in you than many people I've come across, you know. You know, and, and I thought, what, what an amazing statement to make, you know. And I was quite humbled by it, actually, and I said, well, you know, if that is the case, you know, that... that that encourages me and um, you know I'm, I'm thankful that the Lord is working through me like that you know because I was mindful of the fact that you know that you have to be very very careful when you receive those kind of compliments because it can puff you up it can you know bring in the sin of pride and I don't consider myself in any better than anyone else you know in fact I as I said to the, one of the brothers yesterday I said I said my only desire is to be a vessel for God you know for his glory and my greater good you know and as I said, I, I, you know, and I made Edward laugh, laugh with his joke, you know, when I said about how, um, what is it, you know, I, I want to be a flower pot for the Lord and not a chamber pot, yeah, you know. So, continuing, yeah. The one who sees his natural face in the mirror will have no power to obey. As James 1.23 says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a mirror. These are the ones who do not unite faith with the gospel so that it can be fulfilled in them. Romans 6.11 says, Even so reckon, that means consider it done, ye also yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Therefore let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey the lust thereof. See, notice the way to not let sin reign is to reckon yourself to be immune to it because you are dead. It is to believe that Jesus took away your sin and that you are free to obey God. God gives power to save from sin to those who believe the true gospel. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. See, those who do not accept their power over sin by faith will prove themselves tares and not wheat when they do not bear fruit. Romans 6.17 says, But thanks be to God that whereas ye were servants of sin, ye became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching whereupon you were delivered. And being made free from sin, ye became servants of righteousness. The true teaching believed and acted on by the heart sets free from sin. Jesus said, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. See, if our truth is not setting us free, either it is not the truth, or we do not really believe it. If you have not had victory, study the truth, not religion. I recently received a woe is me email from a friend. That's the author, by the way, not me. <laughs> who was grieved over his inability to overcome a certain sin. Highlighted it, I highlighted in his later phrase the following. I couldn't resist. I'm hooked. My flesh is weak. They really got me. I have no hope. No willpower. I'm defeated. And I'm licked. And it sent it back to him with this following note. Just because you fail does not mean you give up faith. You were delivered of this sin 2,000 years ago. 
Compare what you've believed in these phrases with what you should believe. I sent him the gospel message of our deliverance from sin. You have a lot of faith to stay in bondage. Even if you're a failure, even in your failure, you must walk by faith in order to get out of bondage. See, my friend's will was against the sin, so it was not a willful disobedience. His failure was in his faith. He believed everything he should not have, and that robbed him of power. Faith that fizzled out at the finish had a flaw in it from the first. If we sin, there are some steps we should take to lay a foundation for our faith. If we say that we have no sin, in other words, justify self, we are deceived. Quoting 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. See, if we confess our sins, we will be forgiven and cleansed from all sin. Quoting verse 9. We should first confess our sins, then, as the Israelites who had been bitten of the serpents set, turned and set their eyes on the sacrificial servant on the pole. Seeing their sin and curse on him, we should turn and confess the sacrifice of Jesus. Quoting Numbers 21.8 From then on, we should believe that our sin has been put on him and we are delivered. As John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. See, God's complaint about the Old Testament law was that it could not make perfect them that draw nigh, according to Hebrews 10.1. For it is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, quoting verse 14. So the Old Testament had a blood covering and forgiveness, but could not deliver from the sin nature. Many today are preaching only what that covenant offered, leaving those that believe them in bondage to sin. Many of you, upon coming to the Lord, experience total deliverance from certain sins. What the real gospel teach, teach, teaches is that God wants to continue that process. You know, I know I still have fleet flaws. I still have weaknesses. You know, I'm not going to go into details, but you know, one of the things is I'm, I'm a man who lives alone. You know, I do not have the company of a, a good woman. You know, and so I slip from time to time. You know. But I, I beg forgiveness and, and I hope that, you know, that in the end, you know, Christ's power within me will completely eradicate it. You know, maybe it's the thorn in my side, I don't know. Maybe maybe that's the thing that, you know, that, you know, whereas that's what Paul complained about, you know, where his was covetousness. You know what I mean, uh, God was saying, my grace is sufficient. Yeah. That's why we have that wonderful gift from God. You know. I hear it commonly preached that we are just sinners saved by grace. It may surprise you to know that there is no such saying in God's word. Sinner saved by grace is an oxymoron. A man is either a sinner or he is saved from sin by grace. Jesus always made a distinction between his followers and sinners. In Matthew 26:45, we read, The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. In Luke 6:33, we find, And if ye do good to them that do good to you, what thank have ye? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? Even sinners lent the sinners to receive again as much. It has been said that Paul as a disciple claimed to be the chief of sinners. False. He said that he was the chief of those that Jesus came to save from sin. In 1 Timothy 1.15 we read, Faithful is a saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And, and of whom I am chief. See, God was showcasing Paul as an example of his power to save anyone. And in verse 16 we read, Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me as chief might Jesus Christ show forth all his long suffering, for an example of them that should therefore believe on him unto eternal life. See, Paul had just said that his sins were in his past by God's enabling power, and that he was now counted among the faithful. Verse 12, he says, I thank him that enabled me, even Christ Jesus our Lord, for that he counted me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though I was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and injurious, howbeit I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. See, Paul included himself when he said that we were sinners, but we were made righteous. In Romans 5 8, we read, But God commendeth his own love towards us in that. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For and verse nineteen, for as though the one man's disobedience sorry, for as through the one man's disobedience that many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one shall the many be made righteous. In Galatians two seventeen we read, But if, 
While we sought to be justified in Christ, we ourselves also were found sinners. Is Christ a minister of sin? God forbid. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, Or know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? See, be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with men, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye were washed, but ye were sanctified, but ye were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in the Spirit of our God. So the Lord through Paul said that Jesus is separated from sinners. Hebrews 7.26 says, For such a high priest became us, holy, garless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Those who justify themselves in their sin by saying that we are all just sinners saved by grace will not obtain mercy through our high priest. Proverbs 28.13 says, He that covereth his transgressions shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall obtain mercy. David said that sinners would be separated from among the righteous and would be judged. Psalms 1.1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the wicked, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of scoffers. Therefore the wicked shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. So if we believe the deceiver's gospel, that we're always going to be sinners instead of made free from sin, then that is what we will have. Jesus said, As thou hast believed, so it be done unto thee, and according to your faith be it done unto you. It is important that we believe exactly what the word says. It is important that we see the biblical Jesus in a mirror and not another Jesus of man's making. Quoting 2 Corinthians 11.4 if in a mirror we are looking at the humanistic Jesus preached most often today, then that is the only image we can come into. This is a Jesus who has no power. Does the Jesus in your mirror have power over sin and the curse? Does he have power to minister healing, deliverance and provision? If so, then that is what he will be able to do through you. Well, I must admit I haven't experienced that myself yet. But the interesting thing was when I didn't know the Lord, and I guess... That was Satan at work, I don't know, although I don't know whether Satan could do that to us. But then again, it could have been. It could, I, I could have had a, a, a deceiving spirit. But I remember a time when I experienced actually healing hands. It was only briefly, but, you know, this person declared that uh, because I laid my hand on, on, on them, they felt warmth and the pain went away. So, um, you know. And now I'm... <laughs> I didn't have warm hands and a cold heart, because <laughs> if I had a cold heart, I wouldn't have bothered to lay hands on them to try and take away their pain, just in case any of you out there wanted to slip that one in. But, um, yeah, so, so it is possible. It is possible. You know, I'm, ju I'm just patiently waiting upon the Lord, and, I, and, you know, and as I say to people, like, you know, allow the Lord to do a wondrous work in you, you know, because he will do wondrous works in us. You know, as long as we believe. That's all it means. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. You know, it was only, that was part of my um, uplifting doctrines that I was teaching yesterday. You know, I said, remember, I said, you know, Peter got out of the boat, didn't he? He was walking on the water, albeit briefly. What happened? He looked back. Probably like, you know, the simple nature he wanted to say, hey, guys, look what I'm doing. Hey, look, I'm walking the water. Hey, wow. You know, and then as he looked, forward again he saw the storm in the horizon coming towards him and he stopped believing he thought that's it the storm's coming i'm gonna drown and he sunk and what was jesus kind's word to him he said oh ye of little faith yeah that was if only you believed you know this is why jesus gave us that wonderful encouraging line where he said he says if your faith is as small as a t tiny tiny mustard seed yeah and you want that mountain to move into the sea, then it will go there. You know? But, uh, no, no, you know. If only you believed. Do you realize what a wondrous world this would be if people believed? There'd be such a repentance, there'd be such a change overnight. Even the rich folks would be. You know, they, they, they'd suddenly realise all the damage and all the suffering that they're causing and, 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 and they, you know? But no, they trust their own flesh, don't they, you see? 
So they don't understand that God has already blessed them. He's blessed them with all their wealth so that they can, like, you know, make this place a paradise. But now they want to skip corners. They want to amass more profits. Well, remember, the root of all evil is the love of money. So, um, you know, and as the Bible says, those who put their faith in silver and gold, it's going to become canker. It's going to become of no use. You know? In Colossians 1 21 we read, And you, being in time not sorry, being in time past, alienated and enemies in your mind in your evil works, yet now have he can re reconciled, that means exchanged, in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and without blemish and unreprovable before him. If so be ye be that ye continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye heard, that's the original gospel. See, we are now reconciled because of the cross, if we continue in faith, unwavering from the true gospel. The Greek word translated reconciled here means exchanged. On the cross, Jesus exchanged his life, blessings and power, for our old life, curse and weakness. Our old life and its penalty, the curse, are on the cross. And now Christ lives in us. God exchanges us to present us holy and without blemish, to deliver us from our evil past works. The Christ who is blessed with righteousness and power will exercise sovereignty through us because he lives in us. We are now ministers of this reconciliation. See 2 Corinthians 5, 18-21. In other words, it is our job to administer the exchange to those who believe so that people are saved from sin, healed, delivered and provided for. So the curse is enumerated in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and it covers everything bad that happens to man as a result of breaking God's laws. Jesus bore this curse so that we would have authority over it and both in our own lives and in the lives of others who believe. In Galatians 3.13 we read, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, that upon the Gentiles might come the blessings of Abraham in Christ Jesus. See, Jesus became the curse and now we who believe have the blessings of Abraham. He was blessed in all things, see Genesis 4.21. The exchange was accomplished at the cross, but will be manifested as we apply the gospel by faith to the curse. See, before the fall, Adam lived in the Garden of Eden with no sickness, corruption, or lack of any kind. Look around you. The curse is manifested in all of the creation because of the fall. In his life and in his death, Jesus destroyed the curse. He passed on this ministry to his disciples, and they were commanded to pass it on to their disciples, and on down to us. See Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Eventually this gospel was totally corrupted by religion, so that what was passed on was a form of godliness that denies the power thereof. Quoting 2 Timothy 3.5 So the Holy Spirit empowers those that have received him to come into all that Christ is. Paul prays this in Ephesians, that he should grant you, according to the riches of his glory, that ye may be strengthened with power through his Spirit, in the inward man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, to the end that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be strong to apprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye may be filled unto all the fullness of God. See Ephesians 3, 16-19. See the full scope of Christ, his breadth, length, height, depth and love was provided to us through faith. Christ is to be apprehended by faith as we are empowered by God's Spirit that ye may be filled unto all the fullness of God does it seem too good to be true gospel means good news I did not write the word I just believe it and that's that's me as well as the author yeah so don't don't let religion stop you brothers and sisters notice the phrase the fullness of God if as Genesis chapter 1 says each seed brings forth after its own kind then what seed has been sowed in us? First by our parents, we were all born of the seed of fallen humanity. Then, according to the parable of the sower, we received the seed, in the Greek term sperma, or sperm, of the word Jesus, and are born again from above. That seed of the word is not the seed of man, but God. See, as John 1.1 1, 1 reads, the word was God. And John 3.6 says, 
that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit Jesus himself said marvel not that I said unto thee ye must be born anew or as the Greek says from above when Jesus told the Jews that he was the son of God they tried to stone him saying thou being a man makest thyself God quoting John 10 29 to 33 they knew that if God had a son he would be of God also John 10 34 Jesus asked them is it not written in your law I said ye are gods if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken say ye of him whom the father sanctified and sent into the world thou blasphemest because I said I am the son of God in the original language there was no capital or lowercase letters for words such as God or spirits Jesus was saying that the Jews who had received the Old Testament word of the letter were by position gods how much more then are we who have received the New Testament word of the spirit we are gods not in the flesh for that is the seed of man but in the spirit for that is the seed of God Jesus said the words that I have spoken unto you are spirit since each seed brings forth after its own kind the son of a dog is a dog the son of a man is a man and the son of God is God the more of God's seed that we give good earth to the more God manifests himself in us Romans 1 3 says concerning his son who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh see Jesus was son of man in the flesh who was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness so son of God in the spirit by the resurrection from the dead even Jesus Christ our Lord you see we as Jesus are son of man in the flesh but son of God in the spiritual man Hebrews 2 17 says wherefore it behooved him in all things to be made like unto his brethren so Jesus was made like us in everything as 18 says for in that he himself has suffered being tempted he is also able to succor that means come to the aid of us that are tempted as son of man Jesus knew temptation and is therefore able to help us our Jesus is the only begotten born son of God and we are reborn sons of God through him Ephesians 4 11 to 13 says and he gave some to be apostles some prophets some evangelists some pastors and some and some teachers of course the Nicolaitan era quoting Revelations 2 6 and 15 teaches that some of these ministries are done away with but the word says no such thing it says for the perfecting of the saints unto the work of ministering unto the building up of the body of Christ till we all attain unto the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a full grown man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and I saw that yesterday amongst the people there you know I could see those who were you know following Calvinist or Catholic doctrines um, even as I was witness passed by <laughs> yeah you know see and, and you know and, and I was saying this you know explicitly to people I said I said you've got to stop following the teachings and doctrines of men you've got to start obeying Jesus Jesus kept on saying this time and time again do not fo follow the teachings and doctrines of men yeah and do not well he actually said not just that but he said also traditions yeah and what was the other thing beware the yeast of the Pharisees where well, he said it only one little lump yeah one lump of leaven leavens the whole yeah so only needs to be one little doctrinal diversion and the whole thing is a diverse doctrine and it's not of God although it appears to be the fullness of Christ all of his righteousness and ministry are provided for us the apostate church tells us that this statue is unattainable because they count on man's ability not God's see they are saying that God is unable or unwilling to completely save us from the power of sin and corruption but Hebrews 7:25 says wherefore also he is able to save us to the uttermost and that's a Greek for completely them that draw near unto God through him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them I hear some say Dave that's the author yeah I do not see any of these people around how can this be well first of all without a mind completely renewed by the word we could not discern them Jesus was discerned by very few as being in the fullness of God the leaders of Israel did not recognize him even the disciples questioned him Peter rebuked him and Thomas doubted him 
Secondly, he has saved the best wine for last. In Second Thessalonians we read, 1.10 When he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be marveled at in all them that believed, because our testimony unto you was believed in that day. See, Paul believed that there was a day coming when the saints would have grace to believe his teaching and manifest Jesus. The text declares that the Lord would come when this happens. After all, his crop has come to maturity, ready for the harvest. In verse 11 we read, To which end we also pray always for you, that our God may count you worthy of your calling, and fulfill every desire of goodness and every work of faith with power, and that the name, which means in Greek character and authority, of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the grace of God through the faith of saints will manifest the character and authority of Jesus in preparation for his work and his coming. The prophet Joel declares a full restoration of all that the curse and religion has taken from God's people. Joel 2.23 says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he giveth you the former, or early rain, in just measure, and he caused to come down from you, for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain, in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vat shall overflow with new wine and oil, bearing much fruit. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. See, these insects will represent the curse of God on God's crop, which are his people. God said that the early and latter rain would restore his people from the years of devastation. This rain was identified in Joel chapter 2, 28 and 29, as the outpouring of the Spirit on God's people. Peter quotes Joel 2, 28 29, declaring that the outpouring of the Spirit on Pentecost was a fulfillment of this prophecy. Acts 2, 16 we read, But this is that which hath been spoken through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, saith God, I will pour forth of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. In other words, the former reign of the Spirit came in the last days of the Old Testament of God. Sorry, people of God. And the latter reign will come in the last days of the New Testament people of God. This former reign came to the Jews that believed, to restore them after a great falling away, and then it was passed on to the Gentiles. Those disciples who received that power of the Spirit walked as Jesus walked and did his works. The pagans called them Christians, meaning Christ-like. There is not enough evidence to convict many of that today, but the story is not over. For almost 2,000 years, only a few have been partakers of the former reign. <coughs> Excuse me. A little attack there from Satan, no doubt. <coughs> the latter reign will come to those who believe to restore the fallen church to Christ's likeness, and now it will be passed on to the Jews. When will that latter rain come? Both the Jews and the church have fallen away from what was given in the Gospels and Acts for almost 2,000 years. The Spirit of God says, Hosea 5.15 I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offence and seek my face. In their affliction they will seek me earnestly. See, this is clear that the Lord left Israel and the church to their own self-will and false leadership. In the midst of affliction, which has already started, there will be repentance. His people will say, as it's quoted in Hosea 6.1, Come, let us return to our Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. On the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live before him. And let us know, let us follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is sure as the morning, and he will come unto us as the rain, as the latter rain that watereth the earth. So the Lord will come as the latter rain. The Holy Spirit will manifest in those who receive him, Jesus Christ. We see here that on the morning of the third day, the latter rain outpouring will come to empower and restore after two day, that's 2,000 years, falling away period. What are these two days? And when is the morning of the third day? In 2 Peter 3.8 we read, But forget not this one thing, beloved, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. See, having read the writings of the early church fathers, that's him, not me, I can tell you that they commonly believed in the 1,000 year prophetic day, and that after six of these days, from the beginning, the end time would come. The Hindus, the Muslims and the Jews also believed this. The author Gibbon, in his book, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, said that the early Christians believed this. 
I have found in scripture over a dozen astounding revelations using the 1,000 year day pointing to, to this time in which we live. The Bible is laid out in seven prophetic 1,000 year days. These days are always numbered from the creation of the first Adam or the birth of the last Adam. In 1 Corinthians 15.45 we learn Jesus Christ, sorry, quoting 1 Corinthians, yeah, Jesus Christ, there were 4,000 years or four days between the Adams. Since the days of Jesus, the calendar was tampered with extensively, but most believe we have come to the morning of the third day, or beginning of the third thousand years, from the last Adam's birth. It is also the morning of the seventh day, or the beginning of the seven thousand years from the first Adam. This is when the end time begins, and God finishes his work. In Genesis 2.2 we read, And on the seventh day God finished his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. See, according to this type, God is about to finish his new creation work on this morning of the seventh day, also called the third day in some types, and rest. This soon coming latter rain outpouring will restore the true believers to the holiness, power, and ministry of Jesus. As Solomon said, That which hath been is that which shall be, and that which hath been done is that which shall be done. Quoting Ecclesiastes 1.9 What happened with the former rain in Acts will also happen in the latter rain, Acts of our days. The apostate people of God will fight against this move of the Spirit and be rejected. The persecuted, Spirit-filled remnant will, by signs and wonders, bring revival to lovers of truth worldwide. The former rain was first offered to Israel, but as many blasphemed, it was given to the Gentiles. The latter rain will be the first to be given to the church, but when many blaspheme, it will be given to a remnant of Israel. I thank my God, and I agree with him, that by his grace I was not stubborn, but received his early rain. It has given to me a miraculous life of God's provision, but the latter rain will be far greater. Do all believers have the former or yearly rain of the Holy Spirit? Jesus said to his disciples, Ye who will follow me in the regeneration. That's Matthew 90, 28. See, regeneration comes from the Greek word meaning new birth. The disciples were born again, but did not have the Holy Spirit because Jesus told them, He abideth with you and shall be in you, quoting John 14, 17. He later told them, But ye shall receive power, when the Holy Spirit come, is come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. See, when the Spirit comes, we receive the power needed to be witnesses of Jesus. The disciples were, calling, were called Christians by the lost because they did the works of Jesus. The apostate church of our day has separated many from this infilling power by saying that all who are born again automatically have the Holy Spirit. Obviously, Jesus did not teach this, nor did the disciples teach it later. Paul did not believe it. In Acts 91, he's, Paul says, he found certain disciples, and he said unto them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we did not so much as hear whether the Holy Spirit was given. See, these disciples had not experienced the infilling of the Spirit. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spake with tongues, and prophesied. Why would believers need to be prayed for to receive the Holy Spirit if it was automatic? As with every New Testament case, they knew when they received, because the Spirit came with signs and gifts. Acts 8.14 says, Now when the apostles that were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet it was fallen upon none of them, only they had been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. See, baptized believers did not receive the Holy Spirit until the apostles came and prayed for them. Our spirit must be born again before the Holy Spirit will come to dwell in it. The lost cannot receive the Spirit of Jesus, for Jesus said, The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, quoting John 14, 17. So the promise of the covenant is clear, that those who have a new spirit can have my spirit. In Ezekiel 36, 26 it says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep mine ordinances and do them. When God's Spirit comes to dwell in our born-again spirit, he will empower you to obey the word. Jesus had two spirits, a born-again, human spirit, and the Holy Spirit, or Spirit of God. When we are saved, we receive a born-again spirit in his image called the Spirit of Christ. Only then are we capable of receiving the Spirit of God into the holy, born-again temple for power. Notice the clear differences in these two states. In Romans 8 and 9 we read, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So the Spirit of God empowers us to be spiritual. But if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of them of his. If we do not have the Spirit of Christ, we are not born again. 
And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So the spirit of Christ does not empower our fallen body, but gives us his spirit of life. But if the spirit of him, our Lord, our Heavenly Father, that raised up Jesus from the dead, dwelleth in us, he that raised up Christ Jesus from the dead shall give life also to our mortal bodies through his spirit that dwelleth in us. See, when we receive the Spirit of God, he empowers and gives life to our bodies, as he did with Jesus. In, Matthew, sorry, in Mark 5.30 we read, And straight away Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned him about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? See, we see here that the power, power of the Spirit of God coming out of Jesus' body to heal. In Acts 5.32 And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God hath given to them that obey him. See, obey, dear friend, and receive. If you are born again, ask God for his Spirit. Luke 11.30 says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? See, God only gives the Holy Spirit to those who belong to him. In Acts 2.18 it says, Yea, and on my servants and on my handmaidens in those days will I pour forth of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. See, with this power of the latter rain, God is going to completely destroy the curse of sin and death in the most faithful of his people. In 1 Corinthians 15.51 it says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We all shall not sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. See, notice that we shall all be changed at the last trump, which is at the end of the tribulation when God takes over the world. In Revelation 11.15, and it says, And the seventh angel sounded the last trumpet, and there followed great voices in heaven. And they said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. Who are these people who will not die but be changed at the last trumpet? All that sin will die. Ezekiel 18.4.20 says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Jesus told his disciples that they would have to lose their, lose their life in order to find it. In Matthew 16.25, 16.25 it says, For so whoever would save his life, that or soul, shall lose it. And whoever so lose his life, or soul, for my sake, shall find it. So the Greek word for life in this verse is suche, or soul. Our soul is our mind, will, and emotions. Jesus was saying we must lose our fleshly mind, will, and emotions to gain our spiritual mind, will, and emotions. Even though all of God's elect will lose their life, all will not physically die. So I'll be changed without dying, because they have already put their old life to death. Romans 8, 6 says, For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. Those with the mind of the flesh must die, so that the mind of the spirit can live. Everyone who has not overcome sin in the mind, will and emotions, must die. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Sin must be overcome before physical death can be overcome. Jesus died to empower us to lose our old life, to gain his life, and to have a blood covering, so that we will be accepted during the process. This process can be finished in a fruit-bearing disciple at physical death, should he not completely crucify the old life while still alive. This process can also be finished in this life, as we die to self through faith in what Jesus did on the cross. There is no curse of death in the Bible on those who do not sin. Enoch and Elijah symbolize these people who will not die because they walk by faith in God. Jesus overcame in his first body, so that he could do it in his second body, who to, to, who do it in his body, and so take up, who take up their cross. Sorry, he abolished all of the old life, even the last enemy, death. In Second Timothy one ten, we read, Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, God will manifestly abolish death after abolishing the rule of the other enemies over his people. In First Corinthians fifteen twenty four, we read, Then cometh the end, when he shall deliver up the kingdom of God, even the Father when he shall have abolished all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign till he put, has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be abolished is death. In the end, after God abolishes the rule of the beast, the harlot, and the old life over his people, death will be abolished. One enemy in power that rules over God's people is the old life of flesh. In Romans 8, 17 it says, Because the mind of the flesh is enmity, or an enemy against God, for it is not subject to the laws of God, neither indeed can it be. See, Jesus conquered all these enemies for us at the cross, but we must walk by faith to see it manifested. The resurrection and rapture, both which abolish death, are at the end, when he will have abolished all other rule over his people, not seven years before the end, when these still reign. Jesus said, I will raise him up on the last day, quoting John 6.44, or at the last day, quoting verse 39. 
There is only one more resurrection, the righteous dead, which must come at the end, so that all, so that all are included. See Revelation 24, 1 Corinthians 15, 22 to 24. So the rapture happens at that time, quoting verse Thessalonians 4, 15 to 17. See John 11:25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he die, yet shall he live. In other words, resurrection. And verse 26, And whosoever liveth and believeth on me shall never die. If the first part of this sentence is speaking of physical death, certainly the last part is, in order to prove the power of God's salvation, he will restore in these last days the faith to believe that Jesus abolished sin and death. Then some will escape death. Hebrews 11.5 says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and he was not found, because God translated him. For he hath had witness born to him, that before his translation he had been well pleasing unto God. This faith to be an overcomer and to be translated will be restored by the latter reign. In 2 Thessalonians 1.10 we read, when, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be marveled at in all them that believed, because our testimony unto you was believed in that day. See, when will these things happen? Jesus gave us a clear clue in the type and shadow. In Matthew 16.28 we, we see, There are some of them that stand here who shall in no wise taste of death, till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Notice he said that some who stand here will not die till they see the coming of the Lord. Where is here? In type they stood before the end of six, six days, or six thousand years, which is proven by the next verse. In Matthew 17, 1, we read, And after six days Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain. And he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his garments became white as the light. Some alive today... We'll see the coming of the Lord because we just passed the end of six days or six thousand years. We are now after six days on the morning of the seventh day when Peter, James and John saw the coming of the Lord in his glorified body. In type, three of the twelve or one quarter of the disciples saw the coming of the Lord without dying. Peter, James and John, who were the closest disciples to the Lord, also prefigured, We that are alive that are left until the coming of the Lord. Quoting 1 Thessalonians 4.15 so the two witnesses were also there representing the martyrs who were resurrected at the last trumpet, Revelation 11, 12 and 15. These two groups account for the resurrection and rapture of the coming of the Lord. This is going to be fulfilled because there is nothing in the word by accident. Well, brothers and sisters, I hope that you find this edifying and I hope it invigorates your trust and belief in God so that you will start saying, I know God can do this where you can start using Jesus' name because it is a name of power to cast out demons, to heal, to raise from the dead. So, brothers and sisters, let's start walking with that attitude in mind, yeah? So that when God brings a suffering person up to us, we say, I heal you in the name of Jesus, yeah? And leave the, the rest of the Lord, yeah? Because if we truly believe, that person will be healed, yeah? Like, Finishing this off, the last uh, e event that happened last night was um, a drunk came up to us. Just out of the blue, he said, "Will you pray for me?" I was quite moved by that because he was actually showing humbleness, and I mean, he, he understood he had a problem. Yeah, and we didn't we didn't batter him with gospel or anything like. So, or, or should I say, we didn't batter him with the Bible. We just prayed for him and asked the Lord to take away his burdens. Renew his mind, yeah? Give him a mind that could solve the problems that were driving him to drink. Yeah? That's simple. Anyway, now, Lord, guide, protect you, and may his light and love continually shine upon you. So, on that note, I will end. Bye for now.